uh, what, I mean, what we do is we just say it's, it's, um, I used to say, I used to call it best of luck support. <laughs> <laughs> You're listening to the Help Me With HIPAA podcast, where HIPAA and humor collide to make learning fun. Your delightful hosts are Donna Grindle and David Sims. Relax, HIPAA help is on the way. Welcome to episode 424 of the Help Me With HIPAA podcast. My name is David Sims of HIPAA for MSPs. And joining me is Donna Grindle of Card. What's up, Donna? Tell you what. I don't even know. I am so <laughs> upside down. I don't know what is up. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about something that we, that it reminds me of Donna. It's securing older technologies <laughs> that's still in use. Oh, you, you, you saved that. We, we <laughs> talked about this thing. You held that. Didn't know that one was coming. Should have, but I didn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, that's, that is going to be our topic for today. But before we get into that, we do want to say thank you to those who follow us and who donate and who support us, who click share and like and all those things that make the world go round. We appreciate it. <laughs> At least make our world go round. Yeah, yeah. All right. If you have any information that you would like to share with us or you want to find us online, you can do so at helpmewithhippa.com. And actually, you can spell it any way you want, and you'll get there. <laughs> <laughs> we won't even give you a hard time about misspelling HIPAA. Yeah, we will. <laughs> That's true. That's true. <laughs> but speaking of giving hard times about HIPAA things, let's talk about a HIPAA brief for the day. Our HIPAA briefs. So, so does HIPAA that. apply to faxing? No. Yes. <laughs> Maybe. Does HIPAA mention faxing? No, it's not mentioned in, in the law, the regulation at mm -hmm. all, but, uh, you're faxing. First of all, healthcare still stuck with faxing. No one else does it, but the document moving documents around, that's a thing forever may never leave healthcare. However, Everybody does, you know, there may be a few of those fax machines still sitting out there, but everybody does fax servers now and all these other things. The bottom line is HIPAA says anything that involves PHI should be considered on your risk analysis and that you should put reasonable and appropriate controls in place to protect all of that PHI. Mm -hmm. So, yes, it does. If it has PHI, if it doesn't have PHI, then it does not. So maybe it does, maybe it doesn't, but it should be on your risk analysis. Right. So even though there is no such thing technically as HIPAA compliant faxing, HIPAA does apply to faxing and therefore is there is a proper way to do it. So there is a compliant way to do it, but that's a, whole nother story on why you can say all those things. The other point being, you can't just listen to one person say one snippet about something like this and then make a conclusion. So about all things HIPAA. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So speaking of which the HIPAA say what for today is also another perplexing. Can't say that in very well. Mm. Confusing question about HIPAA. Which is, does HIPAA apply to all medical practices? What? Uh, no, it no. actually doesn't. No, it does not. Yeah. And HIPAA applies to organizations that take insurance for payment. And as part of that process of taking insurance for payment is that they transmit or receive an electronic transaction that is covered by HIPAA. That's fun. <laughs> and, but the, this gets back to what transactions are covered by HIPAA and the transaction and code set standards are really the section of the HIPAA law that you should understand in order to know that part. Mm -hmm. So concierge medical practices that never file any kind of, uh, uh, claims for anything. Um, no, it doesn't apply. And for the longest time, you could still take insurance and it wouldn't apply because they were able to file them on paper. 
And if you mm-hmm. filed all your insurance on paper and never transmitted a claim, it still wouldn't apply to you. Right. So, but everything's done electronically now. So the bottom line is, if you don't take insurance at all, technically, you're not obligated to meet all the HIPAA requirements. However, we strongly recommend that you meet as many of those as possible within your organization, even if HIPAA doesn't apply, because everybody assumes that HIPAA does apply. Yeah. Well, and you do have some pretty important information. The information is still valuable. Right. Yeah. My recommendation is you're not treating anything differently. You just know that that particular regulation doesn't apply to you. You should still do the security and the privacy and all the other things that it asks you to do because it is the bottom. It is the floor. (laughs) It's the basics. So it's not like, and and I love people who still do this. How, How is it that we say down South? You know, God bless them. Bless your heart. Bless your heart. There we go. Bless, Bless your, your heart. heart that you still say this. But some people still look at HIPAA and say it's the gold standard. <laughs> like, no, it's not. No, no it is it's not. not at all. So, but people still think that. Uh, and it's okay. There's a lot of people in my world that think wrong things and I have to talk to them. <laughs> <laughs> so, with that said, yeah. yes, if you're concierge medicine, primary direct care, med spa. Those are some, some common examples that I run into often that we Mm -hmm. have to, to talk to them. And, and, you know, it's good that they think HIPAA applies to them in some ways. Um, but it's bad if they have a vendor that's coming in and they're saying HIPAA applies to you. So you should do all these things when actually it doesn't because it's wrong. I strongly recommend that if HIPAA doesn't apply to you, you still take up the hiccup recommendations for your size of an organization Mm -hmm. because those are standards for most any healthcare organization it applies to, whether or not HIPAA does. Right. Yeah, it's completely different. And it's the conversation I had earlier this week with a concierge uh, practice was just that. And it was also the discussion about compliance and security are different animals. Like you mm-hmm. can be compliant with something and, and not be secure. Yes. But most of the time, if you're secure, you're also compliant. So let's not look mm-hmm. at compliance. Let's look at security. Let's look at privacy. Let's look at risks. Let's handle all those things. And then let's map it back to compliance and see where we're at. Yes. If you're managing privacy and security risk, you're managing it properly, then you're meeting almost all of the compliance requirements with uh, very little other concerns. It's like business associate agreements and that kind of stuff. It's part of your mm-hmm. risk management. So there you have it. Yep. All right. So there we go. Let's get our 405D tip of the week. Yes. We had a new S bar, David. A new S bar. The S bar. Rock the S bar. <laughs> that gives me so many flashbacks <laughs> those are my college years so uh bar is a 405d product that we generate that stands for situation background assessment recommendation mm-hmm. so it's basically when there's something going on net 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 here are the things that you should worry about make sure you're doing And this particular one came out on August 16th. It discusses the Ransomware as a Service group called uh, Reseda. Reseda, yeah. That's what I was saying. Reseda, Reseda, I don't know. They're going to have. Reseda. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) But they attacked the healthcare system on August the 3rd, which made them come popping out. Interestingly enough, this S bar is also related to. An HC3, which is the HHS Health Sector Cybersecurity Coordination Center within the uh, CIO's office, but they have a sector alert program, and this ransomware was on an alert from them saying we need to pay attention to it on August 4th, 
probably already generated prior to hitting the healthcare organization, knowing how long it can take to get these out, that it hit a healthcare organization on the 3rd. This was released on the 4th. But this one, they kind of nasty me. <laughs> yeah. So they use, they target public facing applications with a phishing campaign that then they use to run penetration testing tools, which is the stuff any of us use. But it's been reconfigured to then use the exploits that it finds. <laughs> How clever. Yeah. yeah. And they do the double, you know, uh, double version. We're going to encrypt. <laughs> and what was it? The encryption level was 4096, some ridiculously high when everybody's like, I use 128 bit encryption. <laughs> this yeah. was 4096 bit encryption. So uh, it's really nasty encryption. And. They release the data if you don't pay them. So, mm, please go learn about the S bar, yet another ransomware as a service gang. And they do not care. They are going to attack healthcare. Mm -hmm. So, there's yep. links to all of that information so you can learn about it. They're pretty nasty. That also brings in the importance of knowledge on demand that's available from 405D, which we did a whole session on, a whole episode on. But if you are following these things, and as it points out in the SBAR, that recognizing our reliance on the internet and the sensitive nature of healthcare data, it is suggested that you ensure that every level of your organization Every level is cyber aware and knows their role. This should include all staff, C-suite, medical, and nursing leadership. I'm not going to point out why we have to say that, <laughs> but we do. So there yeah. you go. And, uh, and some of the recommendations, and I won't, I'll just hit the, the highlights here. Some of the recommendations are you should have virtual patching. If you don't know if you have that, ask questions. Uh -huh. <laughs> Phishing <laughs> awareness training, use of endpoint security solutions, immutable backups, network segmentation, use of firewalls and intrusion detection systems, incident response plan, bum, bum, bum. <laughs> and least privilege principle. So those are the recommendations. And again, most, if not all of those, are part of the 405D hiccup stuff they are yeah and you know you won't see virtual patching listed but patching <laughs> yeah. uh, is and so that's kind of part of it in a different way but you can learn about that later it's not for right now that's not what we're <laughs> talking about what are we here to talk about david oh man man we got we talking about the old school stuff like donna <laughs> and the old school technology so how how do you secure your commodore 64 is what we're going to talk about today. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. So uh, along with the other HIC things that are out there, there's one called HIC Malts, which is Managing Legacy Technology Security. HIC Malts. Yes. And what and so, fun thing to have as our HIC library. Mm-hmm. And this is a problem everywhere. So legacy technology, and this, this is anything from software to hardware to medical devices. It's just what's out there that's been out there for a long time. Some people, sometimes people forget about it, but it's not able to be updated. It's running legacy stuff. Mm -hmm. And you still have to secure it. You still have to uh, understand that it's out there in the environment and doing things. And we still run into this today. I, I still have a client running a DOS-based version of software. No. And, of course, no. it's completely completely air-gapped, but no. st it's, it's still out there. Base. It's still uh -huh. out there. <laughs> uh, well, and the other thing that this points out, though, 
is not only do you have to deal with the things that are legacy today, you need to plan that you're going to have things to continue to become legacy technology. Oh yeah. I mean, we're right now we're up against, um, one of the windows server versions going out, uh, next month in October hits end of life. Uh, let's wish this yeah, one 2012, 2012. Yeah. Windows server 2012 end of life wow. next month. So wow. if this is a shocker for you to hear, <laughs> you better get busy. <laughs> <laughs> we are replacing the servers all over the place right now. <laughs> oh, nice. And I love how everybody waits till the end. So yeah. don't wait till the end because what else do we have coming up in windows world windows 10 so next year you should be replacing all windows 10 devices mm -hmm. to stay yeah. ahead of the curve don't wait please don't yeah. wait yep and i think we we made that announcement a few months back i believe trying to give everybody mm -hmm. plenty of time i think it was an 18 month mark <laughs> like look I we're know. giving y'all plenty of time to get this done yeah <laughs> But the point that uh, the reason they don't say they use the fr phrase legacy technologies, not devices, is once you sit down and really start looking at it, there are all kinds of technologies that are used in healthcare that could become legacy at any time that is not just the medical devices, you know, it could be your EHR. You know, mm -hmm. how many times do you have stuff where I've got one server that's running an old EHR because it's no longer supported, but we still have stuff on it Yeah, and, you know, what you have to do with it. And the fact that there's so many things that if you don't sit down and think it through, everything from, you know, is your HVAC system tied in. Yeah. Right. Your elevators in in hospitals and stuff, they have to worry about the elevators. And then you got the lab equipment. What about yeah. the lab equipment? The, you know, the ones about, I like. The ones I like are the voice reminder hand sanitizer dispensers <laughs> <laughs> that are connected. You know, or yeah. you know, games that uh, the the children's toys and gaming systems that may be connected because it's a therapeutic environment. I mean, there's just so many things. Oh, the medication man. management systems. Yeah. You know how long those things have been going in where back in the olden times. <laughs> Tell us about it, Grandma. <laughs> you know, it was just like 20 years ago, but they were rolling out these medication management systems for a while now. And you go into even just like a small oncology practice. Even a mm -hmm. one doctor oncology practice could have these uh, systems where you would go in and you would enter the patient information and it would, you know, here's the script that goes in and we would make the systems connect and send information back and forth between them. And you would enter the information and it would dispense the proper amount of medication. So you didn't just get to open it up and get medication and it was giving you the proper amount based on what the patient, you know, care plan was. Well, those things been connected for a very long time. Mm -hmm. So there's plenty of technology, not just devices. And that was a huge point that they made here is that we need to look at all the technology, not just medical devices, which so often, and, and we do it, we do it. We talk about medical devices and don't say, let's look at, the big picture of all technology in use and evaluate how important it is to deal with the fact that they need to be secured. Yeah. Well, this is one of those areas where you, if you're not careful, you could be using verbiage and asking somebody something and you're going to get different answers. So if you, if you call me as your IT provider and you say, I want to know what type of old technologies and legacy technologies we're using and how we can deal with that. Chances are an IT provider is going to look at IT things, <laughs> computers, <laughs> software, servers, yeah. network equipment. They're not going to be looking at your HVAC systems, your elevators, your waste receptacles, and all those things. Like, mm -hmm. that's not in my scope of work for you. <laughs> 
<laughs> and so often it's IT takes care of anything yeah. is always the thing. And and you also have some uh, on, on the flip side of that where they believe that all you have to do is scan servers and and devices endpoints and that's all you have to worry about uh, to do security and technology management and healthcare. Mm-hmm. That is not the case. You know, it's they don't necessarily support all the scanner or copier printers that are around. They don't support the medication management system, the EHR. A litany of things are in use today, and some of it was cutting edge back in the day, and it's still being used before you had to worry about security. Mm-hmm. When you just really could trust that all these other devices are friendly and not nasty. We don't get to do that anymore. It's <laughs> kind of like, it's kind of, I equate it to, you know, we never worried about taking the keys out of the car and you left a, a house unlocked where I grew up because security was not necessary compared to the convenience of, Whatever truck you needed or car you needed, you just got it. Yeah. You know, it was you a big a, family uh, farm. You had a low likelihood of risk. Yeah. <laughs> you had low likelihood of an event happening, so therefore you secured it appropriately. Well, now we're talking zero trust, where you assume every contact is is a malicious one. Mm-hmm. Now prove that you're not. Well, we all know. How fun that can be. That's why security is not convenient. (laughs) Okay, so, you know, a lot of times there's this assumption that it's no big deal. It's just a device. But imagine it's an ambulatory surgical center, an ASC, right? You have tons of those that are out there. Eye care, even orthopedics, tons of different specialties utilize these surgery centers so you're not going to the hospital you have them there but they have to meet certain precautions so you have to have backup generators you have to have controlled air so imagine that you take and get control of the heating and air system and you make all of the surgery bays the heat in them run at about 90 degrees mm. Okay, you suddenly just jack that up in the middle of a busy surgery time. What's that impact? Yeah. So ignoring any of these things could have a very serious impact on patient safety, patient care, the ability to care for patients in many ways. So these mm-hmm. are critical, essential functions that are often forgotten about. You know, when we just recently in this decade replaced a uh, nothing runs like a train air conditioner that literally was built in 1987. Get it. Wow. Wow. (laughs) But it's just a matter of time. You know, it's like we're so lucky. But how long do you say before you bite the bullet? Do you want to wait until you're, you know, it's 100 degrees outside and you don't have air conditioning? Same kind of thing. You should treat all of them that way. And when they become this, you know, what would make it become a legacy thing? We usually think about, okay, well, it's no longer supported by the original manufacturer or provider. Okay. Sometimes that's not because they stopped supporting it. It's because they went out of business or they sold out to somebody else. You know, we have a massive amount of vulnerabilities. And some of these devices that can't be fixed for whatever reason, you know, you take the precision of an actual medical device that's required for it to make diagnostic decisions and to operate, uh, you know, equipment like, (laughs) you know, even uh, having an x-ray done. You know, there's things that are one of my stupid friends slipped off a porch and like ankles swole up huge and it's I'm not saying that we have been partying but we've been partying 
and you know your sense of humor is very different anyway and and then his sense of humor is always different and you go in and get an x-ray and says is that supposed to burn <laughs> the x-ray <laughs> oh gosh and it freaked out the radiologist you know all that stuff the radiology <laughs> tech and this is burning is this supposed to burn okay but <laughs> yeah i have those kind of wicked friends and you know it's just there's a lot of other things happen that night around that one ankle issue it was pretty funny but we'll get back to that on another episode the bottom line is it's not completely out of the realm of possibilities that that could happen. That they mess with, they get in and get a hold of these devices. So the vulnerabilities in them really, really matter. And then, you know, back to they were created when you didn't have to worry about things. So they're just not built for this world. Mm -hmm. So how many healthcare entities can you go into today and like i said even a single doctor oncology practice had a ton of these kinds of devices starting with the medication you know what if they're messing with that and what if they can get connected to it and then use it to move laterally throughout your organization so there's a lot of reasons these things matter that's why you should care yep so, what does Hick Maltz do for us, David? Um, it does a lots of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, one of the things that it, that I like is the way it uh, it guides you through looking at the issues and separate the recommendations for medical device manufacturers versus health delivery organizations. Yeah, that's huge. And they do a good job of what they call harmonizing the end of X terms because there's yeah. so many ways that people say it. So yeah, where is the list? Here we go. It is. They have uh, <laughs> the EOGs. <laughs> <laughs> end of guaranteed support. Note, during this life cycle stage, there can be several, some level of support available by the manufacturer, but without a guarantee that the device can be maintained to its original specification and performance. Mm hmm Yeah. Mm hmm And then we have end of life. Yeah. E-O-L, not to be confused with E-L-O. <laughs> All of a sudden, all these songs come flashback. <laughs> <laughs> so this life cycle stage of a product, starting when, one, the manufacturer no longer sells the product beyond its useful life. Okay, and the manufacturers get to decide this. We don't sell that anymore. There's a lot of those things that happen, and people freak out. It's like they expect these things to last forever. <laughs> and that you should support them forever. Or two, or and two, the product has gone through a formal end-of-life process, including notifications to users. So they'll send it out, and how many people read those? Yeah. I mean, most of the time with these things, uh, they, they send it out years in advance. Mm hmm So you're supposed to know, but you don't know. And I'm not saying I'm good at it either. I'm I'm not even going to try to say I'm good at that either. <laughs> but I try to be better. Yeah. And then it we have what depends on what it is. Like I'm good with I'm good with my software and hardware yeah. cuz I'm on yeah. that every day. Now, yeah. am I am I good with my Roomba? No. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and in those types of IoT things, no, nah, I'm not quite so good with those. Matter of fact, I was cleaning out a, a nightstand drawer the other day. And I'm like, oh, check out this Fitbit from like five years ago. <laughs> I, I, I sure do not want to connect that to anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that that's the other thing. Well, I'm just going to connect it and let it get up to date. No, it's not that simple. Yeah. 
time. Yeah. If it can connect, it can, in fact. I think I still have some flip phones from back in the day. <laughs> yeah, those are here. some of the things that are, you know, <laughs> they never really did connect, most of them. No. No, these these didn't. Now, I do have some of the ones that were the early adopters that had the the um, keyboard that would slide out of the back of oh, it, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. and it, yeah. it would connect to the internet. But there's not a whole lot you could do there. It wasn't. It was before uh-huh. the the smartphones. But yeah, I remember yeah. how excited I was that you could go to. I don't know. There was something and I'm showing you. You go to the bank, but you remember how slow it was. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. There it is. There it is. There it is. And they're like, I'm not going to use that. That's ridiculous. It's too slow. And I'm like, but it's not going to always be. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah. So I got a lot of old technology laying around. I don't have it connected, but, you know, I always have this, um, this vision that I'm going to take all this old technology and, and, and set up this little old technology room, <laughs> you know, your own little, uh, museum. Yeah. Kind of. Yeah. Basically. Yeah. Like I've got every, version of windows uh that came out on cd i have the original cds and so i I keep saying i'm going to go get all these like framed so you have all of them all the way back to windows 95 (laughs) yeah your wife would love to have that being featured in the living room i'm sure yeah yeah so uh she doesn't understand how excited i am to to have that done (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Which brings us to end of support. She is no longer supporting you in this endeavor. <laughs> Which is the point after which the manufacturer has terminated all service support activities. Yes. We're not you, you don't call us. Don't don't even think about asking any questions. We we don't even have old stuff on the website. But here's the okay, so complaining from an IT perspective here. It, the vendor gets to say that, like the vendor can say, we're not supporting that anymore, but you're still calling us IT folks and saying, we want you to support it. <laughs> and there's a lot of IT folks that will still try to support it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I, when's the line in the sand when, when the IT people can just say, we're not supporting it either. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, I mean, you, you can at any time just know that. Other people may undercut you. Yeah, yeah, they'll try to do it. Uh, well, I mean, what we do is we just say it's it's. Um, I used to say <laughs> I used to call it best of luck support. <laughs> 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 you know, it's like we'll give it a shot, but I mean, you're you're paying for us to just give it the old college try because we might yeah. not be able to do anything with it. The vendor is not supporting it. There's nothing else we can do. Sometimes you can't even find knowledge based support on it anymore. They shut all of it down. Yeah. Can't even find a manual. Nope. Unless somebody still has it on paper somewhere. Yep. And I'm not yep. going scouring Reddit trying to figure it out. No, I'm not doing all uh, that. No. <laughs> Good luck. So those give us all of our different ways that things slowly die. <laughs> yes. So at that point, you're evaluating what stage of the legacy world do we live in with all those devices? So you really have to evaluate all the devices, all the technology you're using, and group it. Is it currently considered legacy? Like there's the legacy medical device, which, by the way, this is cross-referenced to the internet. What is it? I don't want to. I don't want to get it wrong. The International Medical Device Regulators Forum: Principles and Practices for the Cybersecurity of Legacy Medical Devices. Yeah, the I'm Durf. I'm Durf. <laughs> I'm Durf. Uh, but it's it's a framework, a risk management framework, basically that takes you through all the procurement, all the other stuff, and what health delivery organizations or health provider uh, organizations, those are the things each side should do in this process. So that document reference is Hickmaltz, which gives you the details about what to do dealing with the framework. We're in a loop. I know that. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry, 
We're in a loop. But on the flip side of that, you can be able to utilize that framework. You can cross-reference between them if needed be. But you'll see this MDERF N60 definition as far as when it's considered a legacy device. Not just, you know, it cannot be reasonably protected against current threats. There is a definition that is very specific that you should cross-reference if there is a doubt. Really, we shouldn't have to go that far. <laughs> Define <know>? reasonably. <laughs> <laughs> What's the definition of the? So, you know, it shouldn't require that. Uh, if the car breaks down a lot, it's an old car or, you know, needs to be replaced. Anyway, so you got those legacy medical devices. Then you have current legacy device. It's currently in use within a healthcare environment and it meets the definition of a legacy device. So you have the device. It can be a legacy device. The question is, is it currently being used? Mm. So we define the legacy device, and then we say it's a current legacy device in use. And then the important part, and I remember talking to some of the folks that were on this team about what they were doing with this legacy device, and this is the piece that none of us are doing anything about. The future legacy device. It doesn't meet the definition of being legacy, but we know it's going to get there. Mm -hmm. Let's have a plan for it. Why not? Why not say, I'm going to get long-term care for this. (laughs) And long-term care coverage, something. Because everything we use today will eventually need to be replaced or upgraded. And it doesn't matter what kind of technology it is. For those who don't like change, we don't live in a world where that's good anymore. (laughs) Yeah. yeah. You know, I don't need a new phone. Well, eventually you're going to have to, because that is not going to work anymore. (laughs) (laughs) So let's look at what are legacy devices. Let's define who they are and what are currently being used and what will become one later. And you need to group every piece of technology into one of those two values. It's either currently or it's going to be. And then you work out how you're going to defend a current legacy device. And what are you going to do when the other technologies devices become legacy? So I really do appreciate that they went into a lot of different details on how you identify the potential legacy technology. And I love how they point out this is that yes, but no, but maybe. (laughs) Characteristics discussed are not all inclusive, nor always indicative. (laughs) So, you know, sometimes it's not true, but it's kind of true. So you just got to figure it out. And a technology may exhibit one or more of these characteristics, but still operate securely. So it could be a device that is no longer supported, but it's still secure. Mm -hmm. And I love, conversely, (laughs) a technology may exhibit none of these characteristics, but still be unable to be protected from current cyber threats. (laughs) So really what they're saying is everything could be a mess and everything could be secured, but you're going to have to figure it out. That's what gets back to all you got to do is <laughs> now you have to do risk management. It's what we have to do. Yeah. This is why you can't come in and say, we'll just put this X, Y, Z in place and you're good. Because if you're not mm-hmm. looking at everything, you don't know where your vulnerabilities are. You don't know where your risks are. You don't know what to actually secure. Mm-hmm. Or how. All right. Or what to replace or how. So you have to evaluate all of that. And we know we've got all of the stuff going on. We've got new changes. The FDA has put into place things like SBOM, which I love. 
Mm-hmm. First of all, what a cool thing. S bomb. <laughs> softball softball. <laughs> SB. I see that. I think softball. <laughs> Software bill of materials. And it's that definition that tells you all the parts that are in here. These are all the parts that are in your technology. Software has a bunch of parts. So before you get all scared about what all we're rambling about, there are only, what is it, 112, 115 total pages in this document. Mm-hmm. It's, it's a lot, but it's nowhere near as big as some of these huge manuals that somebody brings out. And it is written in a way to give you very specific help. Right. So, obviously, we're going to focus on the health delivery organizations. There are sections on the technology providers and the medical device uh, manufacturers and all of that. And we know that if you are on that side of the coin, you need to know these answers for somebody on the other side of the coin, your clients. So... As a health delivery organization, here are the things I want to do. When I'm working with my technologies, I want to avoid acquiring legacy technology. Nothing worse than buying it when it's already out of service. But do you know how many people do that? Uh, A lot, because I've had to help facilitate those things as I complain the entire time. (laughs) You know, I I swear, this was several years ago in the aughts that I set up all this new technology and then they wheel in a old C arm that the instructions were on a VHS tape. I'm like, wait, what? Uh, Oh, look, I found a USB plug. I wonder if it works with it or not. Cause you know, that was back in the day when they would stick the USB a connection, but the software didn't do anything with it. They were just hoping they could upgrade to do something with it later. (laughs) So I did have to figure some stuff out. But if you're using things that are already out when you get it, that should be part of you serious decision making. Then I need to protect the technologies I already have. I need to comply with SBOM requirements and take advantage of the SBOM benefits, meaning... I need to have that in my inventories. I need to know that that's being used in there. I need to manage my non-legacy technologies to keep them non-legacy as long as possible. I love that line. (laughs) I need to make a smart, risk-informed decision about whether I need to replace a given legacy technology in my environment. Mm -hmm. I need to support my customers in managing technologies to keep them as non-legacy as possible. And design, deploy, and maintain secure and securable technologies. So, those are all fair statements. And the good news is, all of that is stuff where you can go directly into the Hickmalt's Guide. How do I determine whether it's a leg? Go to page 11 and 12 uh, on identifying a potential legacy. Uh, How do I know that there's a whole section on terminology? There's a section on legacy technology risk management strategy. Communications on, you know, all of the different. uh, uh, Yes, I can do FTP, but I cannot do secure FTP. I cannot do FTP over SSL. I cannot do anything except plain old FTP. Okay, I should not be doing that. So for those of you who do not know, that just means I can transfer data between these two devices, but it's wide open. If anybody's looking at the network traffic, they can see it. It's just like a letter, a postcard. So all of these things are in the Hickmalt's Guide, and you can reference back to the International Framework on Principles and Practices, but... Everything should be in there for you to reference or at least have something to build off of. 
when it has to do with identifying, managing, and planning for legacy technologies. All righty. So um, good stuff there. Yes. Yeah. It just reminds me of what I need to do to plan for putting you at end of life. (laughs) (laughs) All right, Keith. I'm I'm, I'm planning that retirement, buddy. You got to figure that one out. Is Uh, that it? Yeah. As my brother said, the old gray mare, she ain't what she used to be. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. That's true. That is the goal. All right. (laughs) Thanks for listening, folks. Remember to follow us and share us out on your favorite social media site. Give us a review and share it out. That's how you help others find this amazing podcast with millions of listeners. And you can (laughs) help your friends be one too. (laughs) So remember for Donna and myself, the HIPAA is not about compliance. It's about patient care. You've been listening to the Help Me With HIPAA podcast hosted by Donna Grendel and David Sims. The show created to help you with HIPAA. For more information or to ask us a question, visit our website at helpmewithhipaa.com. Neither Donna Grendel or David Sims are attorneys, and they do not offer binding legal advice concerning regulatory compliance. The information in this podcast should not be relied upon or construed as legal advice in any way. Consult your attorney for legal advice concerning compliance with HIPAA regulations.